Did everyone enjoy lunch? Yeah. yeah? It's not bad, right? You got a little barbecue, a little jazz. Um, we actually will have a little bit more jazz up here. Uh, every slide is actually based on a Blue Note record album. So for those of you more jazz inclined in the, out, in the audience, you might recognize some. Have we already done the scoot in thing? Yeah, there's just a couple of seats. Maybe raise your hand if there's an open seat next to you so people can come in. Got a couple over here. Up over there? All right. Well, <laughs> I'm so excited. Uh, my name is Matt Momolik, and um, about eight years ago, um, I started working, I started blogging, actually. Uh, I had graduated from high school, was in college, and started using some software called B2. B2 was pretty exciting for me because it was actually my first experience with open source software. Um, I didn't know very much about code or anything at the time. Um, but I was really into typography, and I created some codes, actually some regular expressions uh, for B2, which turned hash marks and things like that into the proper typographic entities. Uh, I wrote this code, I blogged about it. The leader of B2 at the time, Michelle, reached out to me and said, well, hey, this is pretty cool. You should submit it on our bug tracker. And after I figured out what that meant, <laughs> I did. And uh, it was the first time I had code accepted in a public project. And I was totally overwhelmed with this rush that literally dozens of people around the world were running code that I had written. <laughs> <laughs> then we had a, tra a tragic turn. B2 actually, uh, it stopped. The project essentially died for a while. It wasn't, very, it wasn't like the biggest blogging software. In fact, the market at the time was utterly dominated by movable type and blogger and everything else. Um, but B2 was, was pretty neat. It was starting to get a little bit of a pickup. But it basically only had one main developer, uh, Michelle, and he kind of disappeared from the scene, and no one knew what happened. So the project, you know, the domain was coming out uh, up for renewal. We weren't sure what was going to happen to the site. There was a source forge that a couple of people had access to, but, you know, we weren't really sure what to do. And I blogged about this. I said, well, as bloggers tend to do, <laughs> that it, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but wouldn't it be awesome if... There was something that could continue on this project. And B2 actually was under the GNU public license, which I imagine we'll hear quite a bit about after this, so I won't go into it too much. But basically what this said was that even though the, the code of the project was stopping, um, the project was not going to die because Mike Little, who I'd never met but commented on my blog, and I were able to pick up the code and basically fork it and start right from where B2 left off and start working on WordPress, something that looked a little bit like this. This was actually not the first version of WordPress. The first version of WordPress, uh, it was before we got any design sense, so the logo didn't have blue in it. <laughs> that was sort of our extent of colorizing back then. Um, <laughs> but as you can see, it's, this was uh, started to grow. And who was that Scott Birkins talk earlier? Yeah, OK, good number. I loved what he was talking about in terms of the, the growing complexity of WordPress. If you look here, there were actually we had an advanced editing button. So there were two separate edit screens. There was this one, which was the simple editor, and there'd be one that had like a bunch of boxes and options and everything like that. Um, it's grown a lot. And from WordPress, it, actually how it's grown, it bears little resemblance to how it started. Although we, you know, the, the basic parts are still the same. As Scott showed, it's basically changed completely. And it's been rewritten seven times, several times over, not because we stopped from scratch, but just because over time you end up refactoring you know, bits of code, bits of code. I want to tie everything back to jazz. Um, so for the state of the word, we're going to talk about four themes. And the first one's going to be improvisation. Are there any jazz musicians or fans in the room? Whoa. That is a higher percentage than the average American population. <laughs> I, should, I should know that. Just out of curiosity, OK, who, since we're in the survey time, who came from outside of town? Who's not from San Francisco here? Wow, that's like more than half. Um, who doesn't have a blog yet? Anyone brand new to WordPress? I got a few folks. Who's got just one blog, only one? OK, who's got like more than 10? <laughs> Whoa. Nice. More than 20? More than 100? Whoa. Are you a spammer? <laughs> 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 
More than 10 million? No. <laughs> um, so jazz is a uniquely American art form. It is, in my opinion, one of the first American, purely American forms of music. And the beautiful thing, one of the reasons why I love performing, uh, was it's very much a common response. In a band, everyone is very much equal. Um, you have sort of the structure, the overriding chord changes. You generally have a song, often they're called standards or jazz standards, that everyone knows. And so you'll call the song, you'll say a key, and everyone just kind of knows what to do. And so you have this shared section, which is the melody. And then typically, this is sort of standard jazz song we were listening to on the speakers earlier. It was actually uh, Art Blakey's uh, Jazz Messenger CD, one of my favorites. Um, then you have solos. So each person gets a chance to sort of interpret, work over the shared framework of the chords, but go to solos. Now there's an interesting thing about chords. Although melodies and songs can be copywritten, chords cannot. So chord changes are actually sort of like open source in the music world, which I always thought was kind of cool. But you get each soloist gets a chance to interpret, innovate. And I think of plugins being like solos in the WordPress world. So it says plugins are solos, virtuoso performances built on the chords of core. Chords of core. Can you say that five times fast? <laughs> As Scott talked about, we have this amazing functionality. I mean, uh, there's a 10% rule, which was talked about for Office. For some reason, we got a lot of Microsoft here today. <laughs> yeah. uh, everyone, does, everyone only uses 10% of the features you have, but everyone has a different 10%. So generally, software evolves to become more and more and more and more bloated until it collapses under its own weight. And it's generally, everyone ends up moving to someone that disrupts the marketplace, generally a newcomer that doesn't have the burden of existing customers and could just start from scratch, like start with a clean slate and do something radically simpler and easier. Uh, that's typically what happens. Now, plugins kind of turn this around. Uh, all mature open source platforms eventually evolve to have plugins or some sort of module system. Now, all mature web services are evolving to have something like this. On Facebook, you have apps, for example. Um, everyone is, you know, APIs are sort of the proprietary way of doing open source, and every single major w web resource out there is enhancing it. Um, WordPress had a very first plugin in the very beginning. It was called Hello Dolly. Um, oh, we got some people. Who runs Hello Dolly? Who has it active? <laughs> oh, cool. It is actually, it's not activated by default. It's, I believe, the number 11 most activated plugin across all WordPress blogs, it tens of millions. Um, it's more popular than like Google AdSense and stuff like that. So. I use that stat whenever people want to remove it. Um, <laughs> interesting thing about Hello Dolly is it was created to be the simplest possible plugin in the world. And uh, the idea was that people would sort of uh, take it and adapt it and see how easy it was to write a plugin for WordPress. So we went from Hello Dolly to never going to give you up. Don't worry, no Rick rolling here. <laughs> um, but I believe there's over, what was it? There's a Hello How plugin, there's Bible quotes, there was cat quotes, there's people who have Quotes from, you know, never going to give you up all over. I think there's over 90 of these on the plugin directory. Um, so when I say the plugin number, you have to subtract 90. <laughs> to see the useful plugin number. Um, but the idea is that you have the ability for developers to take this and adapt it and work with it in lots of uh, exciting ways, interpret it in their own way. Now for users, let's say you're not a developer, how does that work? Well, for users, customization is the improvisation. Um, with 2.7, when we released it with the redesigned UI, Thank you, Jane, and the whole team there. Um, the, the announcement video uh, talked about this very fact, you know, that you can customize it to be however you like. For example, a lot of people don't know this. You know how you can make the menu just the icons only? And then it has the pop-up? Who runs the icon only menu here? Not that many people. I like it because you can get to any sub-menu really quickly. Uh, you can rearrange things. You can make it single column. You can go double column with the right area. You can go full screen on the right. You can basically have it however you like. And you know, not that many people customize. But the beautiful thing is that everyone has the ability to create their own sort of unique version of WordPress. Uh, with the, I've talked about this. I think I first talked about this last year. But with the long tail distribution of plugins, even with all the people in this room, uh, it's unlikely that any two of us are running the exact same version of WordPress.org. Because once you throw in themes and plugins and all sorts of things, you have you know, 10,000, 15,000 factorial possible combinations, um, which is really exciting, um, including that one guy who runs all 10,000 plugins. He exists somewhere in the world. <laughs> but what you guys want to know about is what's coming next, right? WordPress 3.0. Does anyone know what album this is from? 
We should have a giveaway. We should give an iPad to people who can call this out. <laughs> no, that's mine. <laughs> so WordPress 3.0 has a lot of really exciting features. The one in which I'm so happy happened, because I announced it on stage, and usually when I announce things on stage, it's, uh, it means it's not going to happen that year, but we actually did it. <laughs> we merged MU and Core WordPress. Um, so roughly one year ago, <laughs> I stood here in front of you and talked about how sad it was that MU was sort of like the red-headed step-cousin of WordPress. Uh, the releases were always later. The, uh, the, sometimes the code wasn't reviewed by as many people. And so we spent a really good chunk, probably four or five months, merging those two code bases. So basically bringing MU up to par with WordPress and also sort of adapting WordPress to be more flexible. So you can now run one blog with WordPress or you can run 10 million like we do. The same exact same package of software that you download from WordPress.org can do both. What I'm personally most excited about in WordPress 3.0 is that we have a new theme. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize this, but it has been five years since we introduced Kubrick to the world. And it, it delighted us with its rounded corners and it excited us with its blue gradients. <laughs> but it's tired. And so we want to give it a little bit of a break. It is no longer going to be the default in WordPress. We have a new one called 2010, um, which I think is absolutely beautiful. The work of Matt Thomas, Ian Stewart, um, it's really, really exciting. I took the photos. Uh, the 2010 theme is names as such, because I never want us to go five years again without doing a new theme. So by calling it 2010, hopefully in 2011, we're really embarrassed and we do another one. <laughs> and that's the idea. We want to do a new default theme every year, because I think one of the reasons we avoided a new theme before was because we said, OK, it's been four years now. We've got to do something new. And so as we wanted to replace Kubrick, we wanted to create like the most perfect theme in the world, right? It had to be a CMS and a theme framework for child themes and slice and dice and all this sort of thing. And it just would collapse under its own weight. And with 2010, we sort of threw all that out. We said, we just want something beautiful first, usable and easy, and that you know, people would be proud of to have as sort of their default. And uh, that simplification made it a lot easier to go through with it. We also wanted to be customizable in a pretty big way. So obviously, You've all seen before the custom headers, old school feature in WordPress. Uh, this is actually the kitten that delayed WordPress 3.0. <laughs> Just so you know. But uh, we've got this new feature. Some of you guys know in 2.9, we added a, a post thumbnail functionality. So what we did in 2010 is we actually adapted the post thumbnail functionality. So this will be a little video that plays. So you can actually do a per post or two, per page custom header. So what's going to happen here, we're, we're selecting an image from there. Purdy. Use this featured image. And watch this. <coughs> Boom. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Oh, <laughs> it keeps going. So basically, the idea is that just at a very simple level, a lot of sites, what they do is they'll, they'll customize, let's say, on your About page, you want something there. Or on your Home page, you want something. And you can now do this for every single page. If you wanted to, you could have a different design. So every single post on your blog is completely unique, like a beautiful snowflake. And that's possible now. But we said, well, you know, we wanted like a, like a mullet. Like sometimes the party is in front, sometimes it's in the back. So we also had a background <laughs> customization. <laughs> Uh, for example, you can do tile backgrounds, like this beautiful grass thing. Uh, you can do centered and just colored backgrounds. And this was actually sort of inspired uh, by the incredible amount of customization people are able to do with a very limited background functionality on Twitter. I was impressed by that and thought, well, why not just build that into a theme? And so with basically a couple of clicks, you can make your 2010 look really custom. In fact, it's what we've been using for the WordPress Foundation website because the idea behind 2010 is it kind of disappears. And it, your images, your photos, whatever, become sort of the highlight. 2010 also has drop-down menus, which is kind of fun. Number one most requested feature for a CMS theme. But once we started doing the drop-down menus, we thought, well, isn't that cool? All your pages are there. But what if you really want to customize them? So the biggest feature, most exciting feature in WordPress 3.0, the menu editor. As you can see, you can add anything 
to the menu. You can create any number of menus on any post. Save it. Add links to either pages, categories, or entirely separate web pages. Like let's say you had like a you wanted a Twitter link in your menu. It could link to a completely different web page. And you can drag and drop it and customize it just like widgets, uh, which is pretty exciting. So now, how many people have made a site for someone and they can edit everything on the site, but to edit the menu they have to change the code, right? And that's the blocker, right? We all feel it. Now that is no longer needed. And this is, in my opinion, a very important step, just like pages were, just like post revisions, everything like that, to WordPress's long evolution into becoming a full-fledged CMS. Part of this, oh, thank you. <laughs> I introduced custom taxonomies last year. Uh, who uses custom taxonomies? We got a handful of folks. Look around, those are the guys to hire. <laughs> Basically, the idea behind custom taxonomies is that with one line of code, you can add things that are like categories or tags. So as you can see, what I'm doing here is I just have a category listing where I've got nine photos of Evan, uh, 1,160. Wow, that's a lot of photos of myself. <laughs> and basically, you just put this one line of code in and it adds a you know, sort of drop-down selector. It adds all the fields. Basically, you don't need to write any interface code. You just write the register code. And it, it even creates URLs. So the URL for one of these will be slash person slash you know, Evan Roth. So you have clean URLs with great search and optimization. Everything is perfect. Well, with 3.0, we're taking that to the next level with custom post types. Even more awesome than the custom taxonomies I mentioned. So with the... Database structure of WordPress, a lot of people don't appreciate this, but it was kind of created to never be modified. Because when we modify the schema, it's a real pain in the butt. So if you look at it, we have the post table, which is essentially you can store pretty much anything in there. We store post pages, revisions, uh, now custom post types. Attached to that, you have taxonomy. So you can have arbitrary categorizations of anything in the post table. You have comments, right? You have comment meta. So you can have metadata on the comments, metadata about the metadata. And what else is there? I guess users, I'm forgetting something. But basically, you have this data structure which is designed to be able to handle almost anything in the world. In fact, I've heard the WP Commerce guys are here, right? Somewhere? Where are you? So they're going from how many tables? I forget how many. Do you remember how many tables were in the old version? Like 24 or something? They're going from 24 tables and they're rewriting it so it's going to be use just WordPress's tables. So basically zero additional tables to run the plugin. And in my opinion, any plugin should be able to run with the built-in data structures of WordPress. Well now, with one line of code that happens to be 12 lines, <laughs> you can do this with post. <laughs> if you check out that bit.ly link, and this presentation will be published, there's actually an amazing tutorial written by a guy named Kovshinen that sort of went through this. So you register this line, and all of a sudden, magical stuff happens. Uh, in the sidebar, automatically uh, things appear where you can edit, add new for every type of post type. You can customize the right screen to have different types of things. So let's say you're making a site for a client or for a friend, and they want to have events. You could create a custom event type that's registered in the post table and gets all the cool WordPress stuff for free, like categorization and tags and taxonomies and comments and all that sort of good jazz, good URLs. Um, but has a custom interface where they can just pick a date and things like that. You don't have to hack around custom fields anymore, anything like that. It uh, should be pretty cool. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and allow people to make beautiful, beautiful sites with CMS capabilities. I decided to do a poll. Um, I just uh, yesterday did a poll and tweeted it out and everything like that to see how people were using WordPress. We can take over-unders here. <laughs> um, in this, we can do it here. Who's using WordPress as just a CMS? So CMS, no blog. Who's using it just as a blog? That's actually kind of mean. Who's using it as both? Whew. So that's roughly what happened. Basically, we have essentially 74% uh, of all WordPress installs uh, being used for, at the very least, a CMS and a blog. This is up from probably 40% last year. This is the fastest growing segment of WordPress. And it's not that people aren't doing blogs anymore. It's that your blog is just one aspect of your site. Um, I, I was talking to a consultant the other day, and he was telling me, yeah, I love using WordPress for clients because uh, you know, generally what happens is three quarters of the way through you know, the project being done, they say, oh, and we need a blog. And you're like, I got that. <laughs> you know, it's right there. <laughs> So one of the other interesting facts about people in this room, besides being you know, uh, more attractive and smarter than the general population, <laughs> about 80% of you are making money from WordPress uh, right now, which is kind of incredible. Um, 
the top three are, some of you, 22%, so one-fifth of the people in this room, WordPress is your day job, which blows my mind, because, yeah, oh yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I was like, uh oh question. I'm not ready for those yet. <laughs> uh, that's, you know, we have, what, 600 people in this room right now, so that means, you know, one-fifth of y'all are doing it. Custom development, 18%, and then hosting, 12%. And I've been totally blown away by the breadth and depth of the sites being created lately. This is a beautiful one called HMAG, just launched a few days ago. Boston University Admissions, uh, Navia Soares, awesome artist. This is 100% WordPress, it looks beautiful. Uh, leader of the British Empire. And what's interesting is that each of these folks, you know, we're in now, it's not just blogs anymore, it's all about social media, right? And so each of these folks also has a social media profile other places. So for example, this is the HMAG website built with WordPress. Here's their Facebook page. Here's their Twitter. You can look at Boston University. Beautiful, beautiful site. But on Facebook, what does it look like? And Nivea was especially rough. She had a pretty good looking Twitter page. But when you click the Facebook link right down there, see what she has in the corner? Facebook, Twitter, Orcut, MySpace. It doesn't even link to a page. <laughs> links to a search for someone's name. That's not even her. I think that's not her, right? Like, this girl does not look like this girl. Well, actually, sort of. <laughs> huh. <laughs> Man, Photoshop. <laughs> It gets even worse when you click on our Orcut. All you get is a login screen. I mean, this is, think of the user experience of this. This is terrible. I mean, look, think of the user experience of this, which is pretty rough, versus that beautiful, beautiful site she has. Number 10 is the same way. I mean, really dull Twitter. So, I mean, the beautiful thing about WordPress, and one of my favorite things, this ties back to Jazz, is it's an independent thing. You can run it on WordPress.com. You can host it yourself. It's all about you. It enables you to do whatever you like. And most importantly, owning your data. Now, the, even if we wanted to, as you hear all the stories lately about a change of terms of service, you know, one line in a contract that now is stopping people from using certain tools to write code for a platform, or you know, privacy applications, or people who built entire businesses on something that then is sort of obsoleted because uh, the business they were built on top of decided that they wanted to do something different. WordPress couldn't do that even if we wanted to. We're under the GPL. It belongs to all of us. And so even if we wanted to, we couldn't change the license. And moreover, not only is it under the GPL, we have completely open APIs through XMRPC, Atom, the XML import and export. You have 20 or 30 different ways to get in and out of WordPress, which is why, much like Jazz, it is very inclusive. But I really wanted, I was thinking of a word to describe this, that we're both global, we have to think locally, act globally, how's it work? And I didn't really find anything, so I decided to combine them. <laughs> Did you guys see Up in the Air? Right, that's your assignment. Go see this movie, Up in the Air. It was amazing. I felt like it was about me, though. I'm not sure if that was a good thing <laughs> or a bad thing. Or... So we got to think local, act global. <laughs> that's what we have here. Some conferences, you know, some platforms, what they'll do is they'll do like once a year a giant uh, conference, Oracle style, you know, rent out the Moscone Center, fly everyone in from all around the world. Last year we had 48 work camps all around the world. That's almost one every week. I, I went to like 20 something of these <laughs> and it was, it was pretty busy. We already have 45 so far scheduled in 2010 and it's only May. Each one of these uh, conferences is as unique and beautiful as the place that's hosting it. I mean, I've been to perhaps more than anyone else, and I'm constantly blown away by just how unique and different they are. And particularly in places and countries where there's not what you think of traditional enjoyance of the freedoms that we have here. I saw recently where Global Voices published a whole guide to marrying a censored WordPress blog. Basically the idea being that you can take, let's say, you're in China and your blog is blocked because you're talking about something that the censors there aren't, aren't uh, crazy about. The idea is that people can make mirrors of your blog all around the world. And you know, all of a sudden, although this URL is blocked, maybe you're available at this other URL or this IP, and it happens real time. And that people are even doing this now with translation, uh, both in and out. China is another good example. There's a team that translates the entire Economist magazine, every, which is hefty, every single week for that audience. Uh, it's pretty exciting. So WordPress is 
It can take anything in. It can put almost anything out. Um, it can be beautiful. You own all the data. And we also want it to be sort of everywhere you are, including space. I don't know if you know this, but the first uh, Anusha Ansari, when she went to, uh, she was one of these people with like billions of millions and paid the Russians to go up to the International Space Station and actually had a WordPress.com blog from space. It was one of the first ever big blogs we had on .com, and it just got ridiculous traffic, linked from Yahoo, everything like that. It was an interesting test. Uh, we've now got applications for everything. When Last year when I stood here, I said, uh, mobile's going to be important, but all we had at the time was a pretty crappy iPhone app. Now we've got a less crappy iPhone and iPad app. <laughs> <laughs> Android app, we've got Blackberry, and we've got more coming here. Um, you know, for every platform out there, I want there to be a really great WordPress application. And just like WordPress, all these applications are 100% open source, and anyone can be involved with them, uh, including anyone in this room. We haven't gotten too many people participating in the open source side of it yet. I think it's because, well, my personal opinion with iPhone, for example, is it's hard to build a thriving open source uh, product on a closed source platform. You know, when you have to pay $100 to get the SDK and everything like that, you're just not going to get as many of the type of people who participate in WordPress, for example, contributing. Uh, but we're thinking about other things. Like an example of something we've done that's been really popular is post by email. We launched this as a feature on WordPress.com. We've gotten over 600,000 posts already. It's just the idea that, you know, if you're really comfortable, some people, who lives in email all day long? Yeah, I do too. <laughs> uh, Thunderbird is like my favorite and most hated application in the world. Uh, we're turning this into a canonical plugin. So basically ripping out the post by email feature built into WordPress, which is really terrible, and adding all the code we've written for the one we wrote uh, to be open. And Peter Westwood and everyone is working on this. It's going to be pretty cool because it supports attachments. You can do galleries through it. You can cut set. You can post to the future. You can do all sorts of cool stuff. By the way, if anyone could write this feature, I would love a Thunderbird extension that allows you to send an email to the future. So. <laughs> Well, not like to the future, right? <laughs> but maybe like, you know how you can schedule a post in WordPress? Right? I want something that does that for email, like send this email on Monday. So if anyone could do that, I'd be down. <laughs> like I said, when, everyone, when a jazz quartet plays or a quintet, whatever, although everyone is soloing and has their time in front and everything like that, they really all have ownership of the whole song because it's really a lot of color response. Uh, what the, if the piano player does a certain riff, the drummer might pick up on that, or the soloist, or things like that. And with WordPress, the same sort of thing happens. It's your blog, your code. I ended the keynote last year talking about how people could get involved. You know, we need writers to document. We need artists, connectors, organizers, code poets, leaders. Um, this has actually been really awesome over the past year, how this has grown. And that's kind of what I wanted to, to talk about on the way out, because the state of engagement with WordPress, I think, is indicative of where the platform is going. Who saw the presentation downstairs on uh, Office Ribbon, or Ribbon Hero? That one was amazing. Is, is the presenter here? Is Dan here? That, that was awesome. Um, you said exactly what I said when I invited you, which is if they can make a game out of Office, you can make a game out of anything. <laughs> I've been thinking about this a lot for WordPress. Um, some of you guys know that we've got a number of things in there. They, they seep out. Like I worry, one of the things I worry about is at what point do we lose our soul? And this happened in BB Press once, uh, where BB Press used to have these awesome error messages um, that were all essentially quotes from Ghostbusters. <laughs> Michael knows what I'm talking about. And somehow, at one point, they got removed because they didn't localize well. Apparently, Ghostbusters is not the international phenomenon that we all hoped it would be. <laughs> And so that was gone. Um, there's fun things in WordPress. Like, uh, you remember the first time? This actually came from B2. You know, you open the, the template, and then there's the loop. And then at the end of the loop, there's a closing brace, and it says, if you delete this, the sky will fall on your head. <laughs> Just stuff like that, I think, actually makes it a lot more human. And when I think of WordPress and its evolution, I don't think of it as a software product. I think of it as a work of interactive art, things that people are, are shaping and, and customizing to fit exactly how they are. A few weeks ago, I ended up in New York uh, at an event called Seven on Seven, paired with this troublemaker named Evan Roth. Uh, he was the artist in the group. Um, 
I loved it when you showed uh, earlier when someone like aligned an image correctly and then it showed like a big box like congratulations you did it you get some points and it's pinging your friends that you aligned an image correctly and things like that. Um, I actually really like that. <laughs> so we started to think basically we had 24 hours to create something at the new museum and we started to think well what is the most we kept coming back we were talking about data and maybe we could do like an art piece out of spam, but then we couldn't show it to our parents, and then, you know, all these sorts of different things. And eventually what we came back to was the act of publishing, actually what Evan called the sacred act of publishing, that there's sort of a huge gulf there. You know, some people can spend their entire lives working on something and never hit that publish button. And so when you actually hit that publish button, it's very special, particularly if you're a writer or you're a creator, that putting it out there is really special. But it can be a very lonely activity. In fact, we created this video to, uh, to show what a, perhaps the average WordPress blogger looks like. And so we thought, well, what if, what if something happened after you clicked that blog post? Let's make sure we got volume here. how can we sneak this into the interface? <laughs> <laughs> so what we did was we created an option. You know I hate options, so that, that's a meta joke. Um, we put this little checkbox on the personal settings page on WordPress.com. All it said was surprise me. And we told people they could check this box. It's actually blown me away. Um, 64,000 people have checked this box so far. It's just kind of insane, because all we've really done is a blog post about it. And basically what this does is it sort of, right now it just does sort of two and a half things. It adds a, a box next to the publish button that says this post is super awesome. And that actually influences what video you're going to see. Um, you don't see a video every time. I won't say exactly what sort of the algorithm is, but let's say a random amount you'll see videos of varying length and epicness um, <laughs> after you do a post. And the cool thing about it is once you see one of these videos, and I think we have 48 of them or something like that, you will never see that same thing again. It tracks what you've seen, so it's actually a very unique experience. Um, it also shows a button, and this is where we're most behind on it. It takes you to a button that says, how does this make you feel? Because your know, feelings are important. <laughs> and ask people to suggest uh, something. And we've gotten like 800 suggestions of other things we should show, which is amazing because we've only shown like 14,000 of these. So, you know, one in 14 roughly of the people who see this want to participate in it. So the eventual idea is for people to be able to record their own, like, good job, you know, <laughs> or something like that, or maybe different languages. We can localize this, do different things. I've been really excited about it. Uh, this is just one I, what if we had a surprise me button? You know, the first request we always got was, could you make this a plugin for WordPress? But I, I thought back to, I had this really traumatic experience when I was younger. Um, I used to be really into video games. And this was like the DOS games and everything like that. And I was sort of like snooping around the directories that the game was. And somehow came across like this video and I played it. And it was like the ending video. Like after you made it through like 50 levels and killed the bad boss monster, this was what it showed you. And I, I just accidentally played it. And then once you start playing it, you watch it. And it really sort of killed the game for me. Because I was like, this was kind of the end point. This was what I was working towards. And now I've seen it. So what's the point of really, you know, it must not have been that kind of game. <laughs> but, um, it kind of messed it up. So if it was an open source plugin, I, what I imagine people would do is just open it up, look at the array of all the videos, and like copy and paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. That's what I would do at least. So, but maybe we can do it as a web service. Uh, someone had the idea of SaaS, surprise as a service. <laughs> but what if, if you know, we've had 64,000 people sort of uh, opt into serendipity. So what are other things we could do? Uh, one of the things we added in there was uh, we added humanize thing on your stats. So when you visited it, it would say, you got 160 hits today, which just like your stats always say. But it would take that number and uh, basically search to Wikipedia for it and find a town that had the same number of people. So that is the same you know, number of people of you know, Dakota, Wyoming, or something. Um, there was a mistake, though, for a while. 
uh, there was a bug where sometimes, because we were just using Google, it would uh, sometimes other things besides towns would rank highest. So we started showing people disasters <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> so like, you got a thousand hits today. That's the same number of people. It was bad. <laughs> so you know. You got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. That was the bad thing. And the other thing was one of the videos, like we tried to get videos of people dancing, and I got this. It was like the like the second email that came in, and this lady was like, I, I did not see it. We, there was like a, a rap video, and like there was cursing in the background. This guy's grabbing his crotch and jumping around, and like we were just looking at like the hip hop dancing in the background, and we didn't realize that we basically flashed this lady. <laughs> I was like, well, you can uncheck the box. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> What else could we do here? Who's seen the WordPress Easter egg? The big one. We actually have, I think, a couple, like 100 people a day see it on the stats we track on WordPress.com. I'm not going to tell you where it is or what it is, but every single one of your WordPresses in this room has a really awesome like matrix animation Easter egg built into it um, that you never even knew was there. So if we can sneak, to the extent we can sneak these things into WordPress, Make blogging more fun. Make you know getting a comment more fun. Make moderation more fun. This is my the biggest thing I want with a mobile application, right? You're on the road. You only have a few seconds. You're waiting in line. You're, you know, waiting for anything. I don't want to know where people use these things. Um, you want to moderate comments. You want to check your stats. You want to see what's going on. I mean, all these types of things can be a lot more fun than they currently are. And so I think I want to find a way to balance the increasing power, and uh, of WordPress, the flexibility of WordPress. With sort of this, you know, Scott talked about simplicity. I don't think it's necessarily about simplicity. I think it's about entertainment and enjoyment. Um, I blog because, well, actually because of comments. I blog because um, I enjoy writing. And, but more than that, I love the comments that I get on my blog because they make me smarter. If I'm wrong in a blog post, the first two comments are telling me how much of an idiot I am. <laughs> and if there's a typo, someone tells me that. Uh, I use after the deadline now, so not as much of that. But uh, that interaction with people from all over the web is really special. In fact, it's how WordPress itself got started seven, eight years ago. Other things going on this year, we finally got the WordPress Foundation set up. <laughs> Very glad about that. And weirdly, yesterday we had three major announcements from three major companies. We had Google release their first WordPress plugin. We had Salesforce do a some sort of Salesforce -y plugin. I think they called it Consumer Prize. I don't even think those two words can be together. And then the weirdest. This is an actual screenshot. <laughs> this is not photoshopped. You can't make these things up. <laughs> so but basically, what's going on here? Well, Microsoft has seen a ton of people using WordPress. They want them using it on IIS and SQL Server and all this other stuff um, as an alternative to Linux and Apache and PHP. You know, I guess it's still PHP. But you're getting you know, a lot of involvement in it. Um, WordPress has grown a huge, huge amount. And so I think it's time, well, in some ways, we, it's, we're setting the agenda for next year. And we're going to do something. I'm just going to talk about this briefly. We're going to do a WordPress.org redesign. I'm going to come back to that. It's my favorite slide. These are the current four, four main committers in WordPress, the hardcore four on um, Matt Note Records 2010. Um, these are the four people involved with WordPress. For the longest time, for years actually, we only basically had four committers. Um, in the past six months, uh, we've started to add more folks. And I want to call them out because some of them are here today. Do we have, oh my goodness, that's a typo. Andrew, holla. Round of applause for Andrew. <laughs> Where'd you fly from? Uh, DC. DC, all the way out from DC. Uh, he's going to be participating in the developer day tomorrow and then the .org sprint on Monday. Um, so Andrew's now part of the core team. We have Austin making patches. Ben Dunkel is the fellow who created all the amazing icons in WordPress. Uh, Ron Rennick, who is also here. Ra round of applause for Ron. <laughs> he's been helping with the MU merge. We've got Jane Wells, who most of you have probably met or heard. <laughs> Helping on the UI. And then finally, uh, DD32 is now part of the core team. It's DD Dion. <laughs> 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 
these are the people, every time we do a WordPress release, we try to run the stat of how many people actually contributed code to that release. And it's, it's actually, in some ways, it's amazing how many people contribute. And in some ways, it's amazing how many tens of millions of users we have with just 100, 150 people being active. We have a brand new stat that we're revealing today, which is actually the number of track contributors. So these are people who are active in commenting, patches, posts, bug reporting, things on track. Any guesses for how many folks we have on there? 100, 150 people contributes. Two? Two people? 200? Oh, OK. We have two people on track, Ryan and Andrew. <laughs> so the actual number came out, correct me, it's not on the site, 1,400. Um, was roughly the number of unique people who participated on track in the past year, which is almost double what it was in the year prior. So that's moving really fast. And so we've got a lot more people involved with WordPress. The frequency of WordPress release is increasing, except when those pesky kittens get involved and slow the whole darn thing down. So we didn't have 3.0 ready in time for y'all. Um, but we're going to do something a little bit different this year, which is we're actually going to take a complete recycle, release cycle out. So we aspire to do a major release of WordPress about every three to four months. So aiming for about three major releases a year. The reason for this is actually historical. Um, between, what was it? I think it was like 1.5 to 2.0. Was that the big one? That was, yeah, that was the painful one. They see there was 13 months between a major release. And what happened was sort of classic project management thing is that we were like, oh, let's just get this one more feature and let's get this one more feature and one more feature and, and that sort of elongated the cycle and so it had been 13 months, which is like 100, it's like nine years in internet time between a release. And like Ajax had been invented in the meantime and like <laughs> the world was crazy. Um, so we're like, we're never gonna do that again. So we aim for a three year. Uh, this year, we're going to try something different. So we're actually going to take a release cycle out. We're going to do a three to four month cycle, just like we were developing a new release of WordPress, but focus just on plugins, the website, and the API. Uh, so a completely dedicated release. Um, this is going to be an interesting experiment. Bless you, by the way. Um, who's heard about canonical plugins? Oh, sorry, that's the last year. We're renaming them core plugins, because canonical apparently is not a good word. Um, but so core plugins are basically the idea that there's certain things in WordPress that should be in a plugin, maybe not appropriate for being in the core software, which you want to keep light and fast and fun. Um, but you also want it to be officially supported because it's just so darn popular that a lot of people want to do this. So what we're trying to do is replicate the WordPress model. You know, dozens of people working together from all over the world with fantastic development tools, mailing lists, support forms, everything like that for all the different plugins, the top plugins. Because when you look at it, there's actually so if there's a, a long tail distribution, there's a power law distribution of plugins. So if we just were able to do this for the top 10 or 15 plugins, you actually would cover a lot of WordPress blogs who could not worry about every time they upgraded or you know, know that their plugin has been audited and has no security problems. It's gonna be compatible with the next release of WordPress and everything like that. But to bootstrap this has been hard because the same people who want to write these things have been also working on WordPress 3.0. <laughs> so we're going to take a release out and work on this. Uh, the experimentation of this, I feel, is really important. And it has paid off in spades. We did 21 million downloads of WordPress last year, um, which blows my mind. That was basically doubling from the year prior. Um, as impressive as that number is, the plugin number blows it away. We had 70 million plugin and themes downloaded. Um, so, I mean, just the, the distribution mechanism through the plugin directory, and this is only from the plugin and theme directory, so third party stuff is not counted in this, is blowing us away. 35 billion pages in the past year, that's across WordPress.com and WordPress.org, actually more on WordPress.org than WordPress.com. And the stat that actually floored me was from uh, Dries, Drupal keynote. <laughs> he, he wrote a crawler to crawl like millions of sites across the web and see what they were running, and he said, uh, he sort of looked at the different platforms and everything like that. And the stat that he found was that 8.5% of the websites he crawled were running WordPress, um, which is a lot of the interweb. <laughs> this isn't enough. <laughs> this is an abject failure. I would be happy because the goal of WordPress was to democratize publishing, to get the majority of the web running on completely 100% open source, free software, GPL systems. Um, so we got about 42% to go. Uh, but regardless, the state of the word is strong. And that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you.
We've got a little time for questions. Actually, a little bit more time for questions. So what we're going to do is we're going to have two mic runners. Where are the mic runners? Right there. And where's the other one? Right there. So find people. And basically, we'll hand you a mic. You can ask whatever you like about anything in the world, yeah. including jazz. <laughs> and I'll do my best to answer it for the next half hour. Uh, hi, Matt. My name is James from Santa Cruz. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about the plugins because um, I don't know how many times I've had clients email me or call me all frantically saying, hey, I, I saw it, I can update my plugin. I went ahead and updated it, and it overread all the data, and all, all the customization has changed. Back to the default. Fail. <laughs> yeah. um, that's bad. Uh, that's odd that a plugin update would do that. A theme update, if you're modifying the theme and you do the update, it's not smart enough yet. It will be, but it's not yet. A plugin, generally what you see plugins do is store things in the database or in the WP content folder outside of the plugin directory. So if it's a well-written plugin, that shouldn't happen at all. Uh, this sort of lent itself to the broader view. I talked about the WordPress.org redesign. The thing I forgot to mention was actually a big part of that's going to be a developer portal, where the problem now is not necessarily that we don't have enough developers. I mean, there, there's a huge number of developers creating a huge number of things that are being distributed tens of millions of times. But it's more that uh, we need more education. So basically. Uh, really, all of 2010, we're focusing a ton on education, uh, be it through learning, through documentation, videos like WordPress TV, through new things like game-like methods. I just want there to be ways for basically every WordPress developer to be the best WordPress developer they could possibly be. Oh, thank you. How about there? I have a question and a comment. All right. Uh, my question is... What's how your name? Oh, I'm Francine. I'm Buffy the puppy. I'm Francine Hardaway. <laughs> One of my dog. Has it's okay. A Puppies don't slow down WordPress releases, so they're my, fine. <laughs> my dog has a WordPress blog. Uh, now I'm nervous. <laughs> How much attention is being paid to making the iPhone app and the iPad app better? A lot. Okay, because as you know, they're not entirely where we would like them to be. Yeah. Okay. And my comment is that my dad used to manage all these jazz musicians that you talk about. So if no you way. ever want to talk jazz, call me. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty neat. Um, so I'll say more than one word. Did you see the cartoon about the allot animal? <laughs> so I'll do more than a lot. Um, the mobile apps drive me crazy right now <laughs> because I feel like we've spent years, eight years now, creating over 13 major releases, a really refined way to do things like moderate comments and publish and quick press and press this and lots of ins and outs. And right now, for example, when I post a photo from my phone or like a video like I did earlier, um, I'm more likely to email it in than use the application. Uh, but we can fix this. I mean, we know we've done it once already. We just need to figure out how it works on the small screen, what's the most elegant methods of interaction there, um, how that small screen app interacts with plugins and things that, that extends your interface. And then this new thing, like tablets. I am gaga over the iPad. I love it. Actually, it's more pleasant. It's pretty pleasant using the WordPress interface in it, except for a few things that we're fixing up in 3.0 around CSS, around hover and stuff. It's actually pretty nice to use. And I wonder if there's something, if there's a hybrid we can do between a local application that has access to the camera and everything like that, but tie it in to you know the interface that we maintain and build with WordPress every time. For now, it's that we're just having a lot of developers work on a lot of different things for every single one of these platforms. It's almost like. Uh, you know, before when you'd have a site for Netscape and a site for Internet Explorer, and you have a site for every single platform and every single app store, and it, it kind of sucks. But the good news is that the web usually wins these things. <laughs> and I hope in the future there will just be one web WordPress again that works elegantly on no matter what kind of device you're on, whether you're online, offline, big screen, small screen, puppy screen. <laughs> All right, next question. What over there? Hey, Matt, I'm Rick. Hi. Would you comment on the future of WordPress security? Sure. Um, hopefully, good. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we, the most important thing, 
basically, if you sort of the first principle is that all bug will always have codes. Uh, always have all bug will always have codes. Wow, <laughs> that sentence has a code. <laughs> all code will always have bugs, no matter what you do. If you could write, you know, bug free, if you could spend money to get bug free code, Microsoft would have no bugs, no blue screens. Um, but so if you take the assumption that all code is always going to have bugs and some percentage of those are going to have security implications, the most important thing is making it as easy for, as possible for people to get updates and safe upgrades, essentially. Notification and upgrades. Um, we've been trying our darndest for this in WordPress, where now there's the, first we did notifications, then we did the core update, then we did the plugin updates, then we did the plugin and themes updates, and now we got in 3.0, we actually have a bulk updater. So you know when there's that thing and it says like 14 updates available and you got to click through on each one? No more, now you can do them all at once. I'm really happy about that. <laughs> um, it's one of the many improvements in 3.0 to try and encourage people to update more. Um, in the coming year, there's going to be two things that happen that I think make security even better for WordPress. One is I think a lot more hosts are going to start focusing on how they can keep their customers more secure at a server level, which they can actually do a lot more than we can at the application level. Um, for example, I, I know one host that's actually doing kernel level uh, file det modification detection. So, they know the MD5 of every file in WordPress because it's all in subject version. So they can compare that to what's running on someone's site and notify them if there's something wrong. Google Webmaster Tools is now notifying you if there's something wrong with your site. And also, uh, Automatic is working on a product called Vault Press that will actually put live zero-day hotfixes to your blog uh, just as soon as something is found. So all these sorts of different things, I hope, are going to be, you know, sort of solidify people and just make them feel safer and more secure. Right uh, over there. Sure. Buddy Press. Can you talk about Buddy Press? I'm sorry. Could you talk a little bit about Buddy Press and 3.0 and what's happening? Sure. Um, so Buddy Press uh, has been rocking along, I believe. Where's Andy? Is Andy here? Hey, Andy. Everyone say hi, Andy. Hi, hi Andy. Andy. Andy, what's up with Buddy Press? Yeah, so there's another release coming next month. Uh, the cool thing about it now is before BuddyPress ran on MU, which was the red-headed step cousin, and now BuddyPress runs on WordPress. Um, so you can run BuddyPress with a single blog or with a complete MU install, and it's a lot smoother experience, both because BuddyPress has gotten a lot better and because WordPress has gotten a lot better. So uh, it's still cranking along, going pretty well. And in fact, one of the things we might do in the WordPress.org redesign is enable BuddyPress across all of WordPress.org, which I would be pretty excited about. Does that answer your question? Cool. Hey, Matt. Justin Watt, uh, justinsomnia.org. Um, how does uh, HTML5 factor into your future plans, given that WordPress has always been a strong XHTML uh, yeah. component? Yeah. Um, well, remember what I said about someday I hope that we don't need all these different applications. We can just have one web version. Uh, hopefully, by 2010, when HTML5 is done, or 2020, um, we can do that. I'm really excited about you know, the multi-upload, native multi-upload functionality and offline storage and all these sorts of things. Uh, we were early adopter of gears in WordPress. That unfortunately got killed by Google in a rather unceremonious way and we were kind of left hanging. But they, luckily they've refocused that energy in HTML5 and browsers are exciting again. Like Chrome is, is kicking butt and Firefox is kicking butt back and IE is like, hey, we're over here. Um, <laughs> But it's, 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 it's heating up, and you have good people on all of these teams making really fantastic browsing experiences, and that we win in that. Uh, the approach we take with WordPress is usually progressive enhancement, or basically, if, if your browser supports a feature, you'll get a slightly more awesome experience. If it doesn't, it just works like it did before. And I feel like that's a way we can continue to be true to our web standards roots, but also you know, take advantage of every single iota of functionality that the browsers are providing. Uh, right there. Hi, Matt. My name is Mary, Hi. and I represent uh, one of the 12% of web hosting uh, companies here at your conference today. Cool. Uh, one of our issues right now is that last year we had about two requests for WordPress sites. This year, our phone is ringing off the hook. That sounds like a big problem. It is. <laughs> 
it actually is for us because we are a web hosting provider and so what we need to do is assure security and understand the system workings of wordpress our problem is we haven't been able to connect yet with a user group that is a hosting user group that can help us with some of these issues and we were wondering if you know of any group like that so like a almost like a web hosting exactly consortium where you can all talk about the best stuff to do and not do and everything like that exactly that's a pretty good do we have who's the 12 percent of web hosts here we had a couple other here i mean something that might be cool is maybe on wordpress.org we could fire up a mailing list um that's the open source answer to everything <laughs> um, we can start a mailing list and just see what happens out of that i'd love to have sort of a list of best practices and everything like that and also through wordpress.org we can use our our influence to encourage more hosts to do what we consider the best practices. Uh, for example, we're going to be doing an audit of all the hosts we recommend to see whether they're using something like PHP Suezec, which is uh, keeping the different users on the same server so they can't read each other's files and mess around with it. Because a huge number of the, the worms that have been going around lately is what will happen is they'll get to one site on the server and they'll just scan the whole thing and modify every file they can write to. And so, your WordPress, which you kept up to date and you updated all the plugins and was completely fantastic, gets pwned uh, through no fault of your own. It's really a fault of the web host. And we want to encourage that knowledge because the technology has been out there for like five years. We just need people to use it. All right, back there. <laughs> Hi, thanks. My name's Mary and I'm in Monterey and I thank you for making something that non-techie people can figure out how to use with the help of some good coaches. Um, I'm wondering about if there's an upper limit word count that is, in, uh, that there was some, at some point some intention of, uh, as a cutoff for WordPress. What I've found is... <laughs> What like, I we only is, allow you to press so many words? Well, they, that I get locked out of post because mm -hmm. I have like 50 to 75,000 word post, which I know is unusual. And what I figured out I had to do to not get locked out of the Are post. Are you a contributor to the Codex? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I am. I do, I do a community service projects through Word, on WordPress, bicyclingmonterey.com and a Her Helmet Thursdays project. So what I've done is I'm going to have a little window on WordPress that I stick a URL and then direct them somewhere else to a custom database that I have hmm. have created, had someone create. So, so but there I'm, should be no upper limit. Uh, that's what I'm wondering. The database uh, field we use is actually lawn text in MySQL, which I believe has, what is it, a four gigabyte limit or something for that one field. So that's a lot of text. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so there should be no data limitation to it. Um, perhaps there's something, some host limit post size. I have um, network solutions as my host, and um, I know when they got hacked last year, they were able to restore my WordPress, so that was a cool. good, good thing. What um, you might want to try is just maybe try out a trial account someplace else and try posting your 7,000, 75,000 word thing. Do you copy and paste that, or does it? <laughs> <laughs> my mind is kind of boggled later. right now. But however you get in there, just try it out, because that's probably an environment thing and not a WordPress thing. Okay. We should be able to handle whatever you can throw at us, okay. hopefully. Okay, that's good to know. And what it does before it locks out is it, it usually lets you, uh, doesn't let you use the visual tab first, only HTML, uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then it completely shuts down. Well, that, so your browser is probably going to, cry and die if you try to use the visual editor with that much stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, just the way it works. It'll mm -hmm. just crunch and crunch and crunch. Because it, it's going to try and keep it all in memory multiple times. And that will, so use the HTML version if you're going to work with something that big. OK, thank you. No problem. How about in the back? <laughs> all the people on the, the laptops there. There's, a, there's like a glow in the back. <laughs> back there. Hello, right up here. I wait for the mic. <laughs> what? Oh, sorry. Did someone have it? Right. Oh, we got a mic up here. So come, come this way. And we'll we'll cue one up. So you can go first, and then you come this way. <laughs> sorry. Okay. I'm first. Hi, I'm Tony. And um, someone asked the Buddy Press question. I thought I'd ask the BB Press question. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> BB Press is interesting. I have a confession there. Um, so I, I dove back into BB Press, and I was sort of, we were doing the weekly development meetings. Version 1.1 is basically ready. It's been coded, had some great contributions from Austin and some other WordPress developers. Um, I kind of got a little burned out on it. Um, there was something, we were going back and forth in the forums, 
basically, the, the future of BBPress is going to be it's just more closely tied to WordPress. Because what's killed BBPress before is we were trying to duplicate everything in WordPress and basically have a copy of it in BBPress. So as WordPress is you know, having 100 commits a week or whatever, all that was having to be ported back over to BBPress. And we thought about making a backpress project so they used the same backend, but that didn't really work. So at some point, it was like, well, we're doing all this duplicate effort. Why can't we just make BBPress a really amazing plugin? Because we could just throw away all this code. We don't need a user system. We don't need a URL system. We don't need a rewrite system. We don't need a database class. We don't need any of this stuff. We just inherit that all from WordPress, which is the best way to do it. And in fact, right now, if you want a form on WordPress, you're probably better off using one of the plugins out there that's not BBPress. Um, this was controversial, to say the least. And I was in there and on the forums and everything like that. And just one night, I was pretty bad. And I was like, oh my goodness, I just can't take this anymore. I just closed the window. And that was about a month and a half ago. And I haven't really looked at it since. So <laughs> I need just a little bit more time to recover from that flame war. And then I'll dive back in and start working on BBPress again. It's kind of close to my heart, because BBPress was, uh, I guess, written about a year after, or a year, year and a half after WordPress. And it was written from scratch, where WordPress had been a fork. So it actually did a lot of awesome things, I thought, that if I could start over again, I would have done. So it's near and dear to my heart. But uh, the, the community can be a little bit rougher than normal WordPress. In WordPress, we have a little bit more in terms of community mores on interaction and everything like that. Ooh. We had something up right here. So let's say I've got a. a pretty large multi-network uh, blog that I want to move to WordPress. Mm -hmm. uh, should I use WPMU right now and hope the transition path to 3 is smooth? Or is 3 coming out really soon? Or <laughs> 3 is coming out really soon. Okay. Uh, so what I would do is just start building on the 3 beta, which will be release candidate soon. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you're ready to launch, we'll have launched. Cool. Thanks. Hopefully. No Good dates? Mm -hmm. No dates. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing this too long. <laughs> hey. Out over here. There it is. Where's that? Uh, keep your hand up. Yeah, right there. Oh. What, put your hands in the air. Wait, Hi, you just don't uh, care. I'm Shiva from San Francisco. I just wanted to quickly mention I had the same problem uh, with the word count, and it, it's not a WordPress issue. Um, we, I have my friend has a basketball blog where he writes long posts on Saturdays, and it turns out that it's a um, memory limitation on the server side setting on PHP. That's what so I the host uh, up changed the limit to a higher uh, memory, and it was resolved. So I think that's what they should do. There you go, people helping people. <laughs> As we wrap, here's one more. We'll do, we'll do two more, and then. So one more. Is this, do you want to be the last one? OK, last one. Anything else? We'll queue it up. So one, two, three. And yours guy has to be the most amazing question ever, just so you know. No pressure. Hi, Matt. Um, this is going to be a really simple one for you, but it's from people that are on Twitter, and they want to know the kitten story. People don't know the kitten story. You keep referencing this kitten that delayed 3.0. So they uh, is Jane they want to hear it. Jane? So basically, Jane got the cutest kitten you've ever seen in your life. And, um, and they started, uh, someone added it to the, she started posting pictures of it to everything. And then uh, someone put on the lolcat, like builder, the cheeseburger lolcat builder. And so there'd be like this picture of a cat on a keyboard being like, sorry, I'll go back to working on 3.0 now. And <laughs> I, I almost put it in, but I was like, I'm, I'm going to do the first ever presentation without a lolcat in it. <laughs> And uh, it just, it, you know, it sort of became the thing, the kitten that delayed 3.0. That was sort of our, our uh, sca scapegoat. <laughs> Scape kitten. How about up here? Okay, where? Hands? Yeah, right here. Um, I guess I just had the question. Uh, buddy press, um, another buddy press question. Do you think that it's like, I guess, stable, um, robust enough, like up to snuff enough where it can be a solution um, on an enterprise. Like, I'm talking about like real big, like blue chip level companies. You absolutely, think it's at that yeah. step, at that stage? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the beauty of BuddyPress is it's written how I want to do BBPress, where it inherits all the big enterprise-y stuff. It's, it's WordPress under the hood. 
And BuddyPress is actually a set of plugins on top of WordPress, what we call the social layer. So you can pick and choose these plugins, and they add these amazing social features. But they still work within WordPress, the WordPress way, if you will. And in fact, there are fantastic examples. If any of you are getting into code, code in BuddyPress is really well done. Like it's written completely to WordPress standards. It uses the database really intelligently, all these sorts of things. So you can build something small or really huge on it. We're actually seeing a lot of people, uh, I don't know if we can announce this yet. There's going to be a major hip hop artist switching uh, to BuddyPress soon. So that would be pretty cool. And he's bringing over like a bunch of users from Ning and going to BuddyPress. So. Should be neat. Hi, my name is John. Number three. <laughs> I All know, right, we'll this, this, this will be a good one. This is a, a WordCamp question, actually. My right. name is Johnny. I run an events website using WordPress, so I appreciate that. There's a lot of people like me who are bloggers and who are desperately looking for developers or plugin developers. And I know there's developers and plugin developers who are looking for people like me who want to pay them <laughs> uh, or hire them or whatever. Is there a way or a function or something in WordCamp where, like a singles mixer, except it's a I need you and you need me <laughs> thing? the thought of that is really funny. Like, hey, hey baby, you know how to code? <laughs> okay, everyone turn around. He's got something that says need freelance work. I don't even know what this is. This is like a human pop-up, like spam. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. Um, last year, we had a whiteboard where people could sort of write what they needed or wanted. Do we have that this year? Do we have a whiteboard? Sweet. So let's use that for just today. Um, the other thing, a good place to come would be the developer day tomorrow. And while you mentioned it, you're an event organizer. Um, who here has ever organized a WordCamp or a blogging event? We've got like a handful here. There's only, you know, there were 40 something in the world last year. So the fact that there's 12 people here means we got like a quarter of all WordCamp organizers in the world. You guys should really get together. Um, and so we were thinking that developer day, we can have all the WordCamp organizers get together and just talk about like what works, what doesn't, what do you do when sponsors are late, all these sort of things that happen with picking on an event like this. It's actually, I'm amazed at how well it's gone this year. <laughs> it's been uh, the very first WordCamp. I think we had the idea like three weeks before we did it. And we were like, all right, let's just do a WordCamp. Like, how hard can it be? <laughs> and it worked. We found a venue. It didn't have internet, so we actually had to like bring in our own internet. Uh, the whole thing, uh, it was actually pretty big. We had like 150, 200 people. The whole thing cost like $6,000, including barbecue. It was like a really awesome event. But just as it gets bigger and bigger, logistically, it got moved. And actually, the reason we're no longer at the Swedish American Hall was you guys. The number one complaint about the Swedish American Hall, besides it was hot or cold, was the seats. They're like, these seats are so uncomfortable. We're like, man, where are we going to get better seats? So we know, how are the seats working out for you guys? Good? OK. We kept the barbecue going. All right, we have, I'm ready for the most epic question in the history of WordCamp questions. Right there. She's up there to the right. Yeah. Is that a Firefly shirt? OK, survey time. Who here is a brown coat? <laughs> nice. OK, so um, I'm actually a journalism student. And um, you actually came to my journalism school for Reno WordCamp. Oh, cool. And um, so since then, we've actually integrated learning WordPress into our journalism program. So it's a required part of our journalism program. And <laughs> It takes a turn kind of right here. But um, so the response that we've gotten from some of the students is kind of like, oh, now I have to make a website sort of thing. And how can we bring sort of this kind of positive community spirit to students who actually have to do it for homework? <laughs> oh, man. Was that epic enough? <laughs> Tough one too. I, I must say, I was not the best student in the world. <laughs> the part of the story I skipped over was uh, dropping out of school and moving to San Francisco. Um, actually, funnily enough, this is the first ever work camp where my dad is here. So right over there, the guy who got me started on computers. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. Um, you see how I redirected to while I was thinking of the answer? <laughs> so I think part of it is if you can find something in a way to make the posting 
more fun. So for example, uh, what I've had good luck with my friends, for example, they, the biggest complaint is like, I have the blog, but I don't get any comments, or I don't get enough pages, or things like that. And what we find is you can get people more conversation, and more uh, page views. They enjoy blogging a lot more, because they have the idea that they have an audience. Who checks their stats more than once a day? That's OK. Let's be honest here. I know for a fact it's like 80% of you. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with checking your own stats. I mean, um, so what we see things is, for example, plugins that send your post to Twitter, or so plugins that send your post to Facebook, all these sorts of things are fantastic in terms of distribution mechanisms. Um, the point I was trying to make earlier, showing the different someone's WordPress page versus their Facebook page, is that these new platforms are undeniably incredibly powerful for distribution and having conversations. But ultimately, you want to redirect that energy to some place where you can actually do something meaningful with it. Your own site, your own data, your own mailing list, your own code, all those sorts, your own domain, fundamentally. And that's why I think I feel like uh, sort of the social networking wave that's happened has been one of the best things ever for blogging. You now see where Twitter and Facebook are going to actually pass up. Someday, you could see them passing up Google in terms of the number of referrers to WordPress. That's a really big deal. And when you think about it, your social network is the most powerful uh, sort of proxy you have to filter the web. I think that's a good direction to go. So that's one thing. Do you have a better idea? Surprise me. I mean, if I posted and saw that video, uh, I'd be pretty happy. So surprise me. Any other ideas? But they're journalists. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's true. And oh, another thing, photography. Everyone has a digital camera now. Uh, working with photos, although it's not as elegant as it could be yet inside our WordPress, it gets better with every release. And having photos in there are a lot more fun. That's actually uh, how my blog started, was only photos. And the captions got, I was using gallery software called Gallery. and. Um, the captions got longer and longer, and eventually I was like, well, maybe I should just have a blog with photos rather than a photo with blogs. <laughs> cool. Any other ideas for the journalism students? Now part of their? Uh, yeah, blog, and this is a good point, and it's sort of what you said. Blogging is a means to an end, right? Actually, in this room, there's some people who get really jazzed about WordPress. <laughs> <laughs> but in most of the world, you know, when you think of now the 20 some odd million users of WordPress, they're using it as a point A to point B. It's a tool. It's a canvas. And they're sort of painting onto it whatever they're really passionate about. Um, last one. My, my answer to that question would be, my answer to that question would be, ask them to do something semi-controversial. Now, what do I mean by that? If you say controversial, people just get mad. All right? If you're talking about something that's kind of boring, nobody cares. But if you come in, Why in the middle... Why did he point at me when he said that? <laughs> if you come in in the middle of the road and you're taking a stand where some people want to say, you're the dumbest person I ever met in my life, and somebody else says, this is the greatest thing since Swiss cheese, the person writing that blog is going to get involved and interested in responding to those things. <laughs> and he did the sign again. <laughs> this is my contact information. It's a little small. I got the number, website, Twitter, Facebook. Work camps are sort of my favorite time of the year because really meeting you guys is the most exciting thing. Every single person has their own unique story behind